Okay, hello, welcome to video three. In this video, we're going to be talking about Confucius's most important disciple, Mencius. And we're going to be talking about the concept of argument in philosophy, which is an important idea that we'll see goes across all of the philosophical traditions that we are looking at. Um, but first, just a bit of review. In the last video and exercise, we talked about four crucial Confucian terms. Filial piety, which means respect for your parents. Um, uh, the idea of a gentleman, the idea of goodness or benevolence, and the idea of Tao. Um, and we did this all through uh, the lens of the second uh, saying in the first book of the Analects. So I want to take a second to talk about um, more about understanding Confucius through these terms. So um, it's traditional with, with, with Confucius in uh, trying to learn it in the West to understand his, come to understand his worldview by adopting his vocabulary and getting into his perspective on things. Um, but uh, there's always there are always issues with philosophy in translation, right? So um, terms have a range of meaning in the source language, right? We see like a word like ren um, means has meaning that changes over time in the Confucian tradition, and um, terms have a range of meaning in our language, right? And so we're trying to it's like trying to nail translating from philosophy from one language to another is like trying to nail two pieces of jello to a wall. Um, different translators will use different words to, will, will solve these problems differently. Um, and for the most part, we're sticking with uh, Slingerland here. Um, but one, I think part of the insight and what it can be fun about doing philosophy it's just playing around with the range of possible meaning. You can start with a Confucian idea like ritual, which, as we'll see a bit later on, is much broader than our notion of ritual. Um, but then you can start to think about, well, what's a ritual in English? And maybe, you know, there are all sorts of things that we do wind up calling rituals that are um, more than what we might have otherwise thought. And so this is just an opportunity to explore ideas, and that's really what philosophy is. Okay, so uh, this notion of ren, or goodness, was really important in the previous fragment, or the previous analect we discussed, and uh, it's also going to come up again in this passage from Mencius that I had you read. So I want to talk a bit more about it. Um, Slingerland, our translator, uses the word goodness, because as I said, um, before in the original Confucian um, uh, writings, it really is meant to be a sort of a general term for something that is morally good, uh, that you would approve of. Um, later on, later people like Mencius are going to associate it more with kindness. So he's got sort of specific ideas about what makes something good, and it Part of that's generosity, and we'll see this in a second. Um, so there's some other translators out there. They, um, a guy named Lays has a nice translation. He calls it humanity, and I can see that. Um, two famous translators, Ames and Rosemont, um, they're big because they, uh, well, Rosemont passed away, but uh, Ames is really trying to promote Confucian thought in America. And so whenever he translates things, he is trying to make it seem as appealing as, appealing as possible in his mind to an American audience. So rather than talking about um, something uh, that you might, might be associated more with like Imperial China, well, the phrase he uses is authoritative conduct. Um, Lege uses benevolence, and that's closer to what Mencius means than what, what um, uh, Confucius means. 
Uh, Mueller uses fundamental human goodness. Well, uh, okay, I had you read a short passage from Mencius's writings um, and answer a few questions about it. And I just want to turn our attention to it now because the, um, it's crucial for understanding a couple of important concepts that will carry us through what's going on afterwards. So uh, Mencius was a disciple of Confucius. He was not a first generation disciple. Um, exactly how many generations down the road he was isn't clear. Um, he is one of a few um, disciples of Confucius whose name was Latinized because, again, the original European um, uh, missionaries who contacted China recognized, oh, this is this is philosophy. This is like what we do in Europe. So we're gonna we're gonna give him a Latin name. But his Chinese name was Master Meng, M E N G or Mengzha. So he's got this famous passage, and I asked you to read it and say what you thought it was about. Um, and I'm just going to run through some of some of it. And so, one thing that's interesting about this passage is it's longer than and less conversational than what you would see in the original Analects. Also, it has a thesis and an argument. Um, so. It has a thesis that's given up front. It says, all people have a heart which cannot stand to see the suffering of others. We'll talk in a second about what that means. Right now, though, I just want to note that he is, everything else in this essay, this is functions more like an essay than a wise saying, like the Analects do, is in support of this thesis statement. So there's an idea in philosophy goes across philosophical traditions that um, we, when we provide answers to philosophical questions, we give arguments for them. So um, I showed you that David Hill quote where he talked about how philosophy was um, answering questions that come naturally to children using methods that come naturally to lawyers. And this is the lawyer part of it. Let's let's move ahead for a second. Um, so, um, an argument means something very specific here. Um, so, an argument is not just a disagreement. An argument is a um, form of reasoning where you attempt to use some statements to justify other statements. So on this slide, uh, I define argument and standard definition. It is a connected series of statements designed to convince the audience of another statement. And what we see in this Mencius passage is that he is doing just that. He has a thesis that he wants to convince us of. All people have a heart that cannot stand to see the suffering of others. Um, and then he, but later on he says, why do I say that all beings have a heart which cannot stand to see the suffering of others? Um, so he's saying, I'm going to give you my reason for believing the thing that I believe. And when, after that, he gives a thought experiment. He says, even nowadays, if an infant were about to fall into a well, anyone would be upset and concerned. Not because... They want to get in good with the baby's parents, but because a baby falling down a well invokes a feeling of compassion. So sometimes Mencius is, people read this and they say, oh, what he's saying is everyone is really good at heart because we all care about babies who fall down wells. But he's not, he's not saying that we're all perfectly good. He's, what he says is we have inside us the potential to be good. We all have a seed that could grow into something good. So look at the rest of the passage here. Um, this sense of concern for others is the starting point of 
humaneness, and the word humaneness there is ren, again, goodness, benevolence, sympathy, um, right? Uh, and so actually he's got an elaborate theory. There are four seeds that everyone has inside of them. Um, concern for others is the starting point of humaneness. A feeling of shame and disgust is the starting point of rightness. A sense of humility is the starting point of propriety. That's filial propriety. Um, and a sense of right and wrong is the starting point of wisdom. Within us, we have all the starting points we need for goodness. And if you didn't have these, you wouldn't be human. Um, now, just because everyone has the starting points of goodness doesn't mean they wind up good. Right? Um, if you um, cultivate these seeds, they will grow into trees that will be your real virtuous adulthood. Um, but if you don't cultivate them, they will wither and die. And that's why you get the kind of horrible, vicious people who were running warring states China. And Mencius is still in the warring states period, right? Um, so what he says is, since this is our final moral conclusion, since all people have these four basic senses within themselves, we need to understand how to enhance and develop them. We have the seeds of goodness in us and we need to cultivate them. And this is, the, this is a general crucial point for Confucian thinking. But what I want to emphasize right now is how this um, relates to how he presents this idea. And so here's a slide that I use in every single course I teach. There are four terms that I want you to understand in order to understand what philosophy is and how philosophy works. Statement, argument, premise, conclusion. Philosophers present ideas um, in argument form. Now, Confucius didn't give many arguments, but by the time we get to Mencius, the Chinese tradition is fully embedded in argument the same way any philosophical tradition is. Um, so, uh, let's start with the idea of a statement. A statement is a unit of language it's a, that can be true or false. There are lots of things we do with words. We can ask questions, we can give orders, we can just yell. Um, when we say something that could be true or it could be false, we're making a statement, an assertion, a claim. Um, we string those together to make arguments. An argument is a connected series of statements designed to convince an audience of another statement. The conclusion is the statement that we're trying to convince an audience of, and the premises are the statements that do the convincing. So we could actually represent Mencius's argument like this. Statement one, if you saw a baby fall into a well, you would be upset. You'd want to save it. And this isn't because, premise two, you desire a good reputation. Conclusion, therefore all people have in them a heart that cannot stand to see the suffering of others. Right? Now, you may not believe... Oof. You may, you may not believe this, but now if you're going to believe this, you're going to have to... Um, if you're going to deny it, you're going to have to cope with the argument. So is it true that um, everyone would be upset if they saw a baby fall into a well? Well, most people. I mean, these days we've got modern psycho psychological science and it tells us that a small number of people are genuine psychopaths. That is, they don't feel the suffering of others. They don't care about the suffering of others. And uh, the Canadian psychologist Robert Hare estimates that psychopaths are about 1% uh, of women and 3% of men. I'll just let that, the fact that that's gendered sink in a second. Um, so 
in modern terms, you might say, well, not anyone, but 98% of people. 98% of people, in Mencius' terms, have a heart that cannot stand to see the suffering of others. And the other ones you want to be sure you stay away from. Okay, right? And you can tell that they've got this because they have a natural urge to compassion. I want to focus back again on argument and how this is um, being, uh, how these ideas are being presented. So here's, here's a simpler form of an argument. Imagine Monica, a person, she's playing Clue, that old board game where you have to, you're a detective trying to solve a murder. Um, Monica can say to herself, the possible murder weapons are the knife, the candlestick, the revolver, the rope, the lead pipe, and the wrench. The murder weapon was not the knife. The murder weapon was not the revolver, the rope, the lead pipe, or the wrench. Therefore, the murder weapon was the candlestick. This is a standard example of reasoning. It's reasoning by process of elimination, right? And if you play the game Clue, it's all about the process of elimination. Um, this kind of reasoning that she's engaged in we're not, is what we're calling argument. Um, and this is something that Monica could be thinking to herself, internal reasoning, or speaking out loud to someone else, like they're playing on a team. But in any case, all of the elements of an argument are here. It's a, it, you have a series of statements. Some of them support others. Some are premises. Some are conclusions. So let's dig down deeper on these ideas. Um, I said a statement is a unit of language, a stretch of words that can be true or false. Uh, it, let's think about this in more detail. Um, if you have a phrase, my dog Edie, that's just a single um, noun phrase. It's not a statement, right? It's just a noun phrase. Is running not a statement. That's a verb phrase. You put them together, you get a statement. My dog Edie is running. And this is, a, this is, now you have something that could be true or it could be false, right? Um, Edie passed away some years ago. She's running in heaven. Okay, um, so we're going to use phrases like statement, sentence, assertion, proposition, all of them interchangeably. And the idea is that they contrast with, um, well, among other things, fragments, sentence fragments, like I was just talking about, but also questions, commands, exclamations. We want to focus on one particular kind of thing we do with words here. So um, statements are what you use to answer questions. They're not questions. I emphasize the idea that argument is composed of statement statements because it kind of runs sideways to or um, counter to a way that a lot of people have been taught, which is to worry about the difference between fact and opinion. Um, and I'm, I'll post a link to the, uh, the a video about fact and opinion because I think it's really um, helpful for understanding that. But um, fact and opinion is not a big deal for philosophy the way it is everywhere else because both facts and opinions are ultimately statements. And so one important distinction we want to make is a distinction between descriptive statements and normative statements. Um, these are all things that can be true or false, but they are, are about different things. Descriptive statements are about the way the world is, like the cat is on the mat, or objects near the Earth's surface fall at an accelerating rate of 9.8 meters per second per second. Um, these are statements about the way the world is. You can also have statements about the way the world should be, like you shouldn't chew with your mouth open, or torturing babies for fun is wrong, 
or if a baby falls in a well, you should be concerned. Because statements in an argument can be normative, we can give arguments on moral issues. I mean, that's going to be really important. You may have been used to saying that morality is the sort of thing that's a matter of opinion, not, of, not a matter of fact. Um, but whether it's opinion or fact, it's something you can give an argument about because norm, moral statements can be true or false. That's just part of their grammar. That's how they're set up. They're just about the way the world should be. So the last bit we want to say is that um, when you have an argument, you're going from premises to conclusion. Um, and that means uh, that you're making an inference. An inference is the link between premise and conclusion. Your premises, like I was saying before, can be either normative or descriptive. Um, but here's a general rule. If you've got a normative conclusion, um, specifically like a moral conclusion, you need to also have a normative premise. So here's another slide I've been using a while. O.J. Simpson intentionally killed Nicole Brown. That's what we call a descriptive premise. It could be true, it could be false, and for a while people had really strong opinions about whether it was true or false. Um, but it's just a description of how the world is. It is wrong to intentionally kill people. This is a normative premise because it's about how the world should be. You shouldn't kill people. Interestingly, um, everyone immediately says, well, this is a true normative statement, but almost everyone, except for pure pacifists, will actually say that there are some circumstances in which killing is acceptable. So, um, but in any case, from that you can get a normative conclusion uh, what OJ did was wrong. So I've got a quick exercise for you um, where you have to identify arguments. You have to tell the difference between statements and non-statements and then arguments and non-arguments. The big thing you want to do here um, when you want to look for arguments is see if some statements are used as evidence for other statements. The baby if people are concerned when a baby falls in a well, that's a statement. It is evidence for another statement. Um, everyone has a heart which cannot stand to see the suffering of others. In addition to this relationship of evidence, um, you can talk about, oh well, people use words, indicator words, to tell you whether or not what they are um, well, what they're do, saying is meant to be an argument. So indicator words are words like because and therefore. Um, because and therefore indicate that either what's coming is going to be a premise or a conclusion. And then these words have a bunch of synonyms, which are listed here in the PowerPoint. Um, for the test, you are going to have to identify arguments and put them in what we call standard form, which looks like this. You list the premises. I've already been showing you some arguments in this form. You list the premises, one, two, three. Then you draw a line and you write the conclusion. So our argument about clue could be represented this way, right? Um, the possible murder weapons are, um, and then the murder weapon is not this, the murder weapon is not that. Those are three premises that leads you to the conclusion the murder weapon was the candlestick. So you're going to have homework assignments where you have to um, put arguments in standard form. So you can paraphrase statements to make them shorter, but you have to use complete sentences. Keep the basic meaning intact. Um, Change questions and commands into statements. So if you encounter a, a, a question, um, and it, it may actually be what we call a rhetorical question. It may be a hidden, actually a statement. So you turn that into statement form. Delete irrelevant or redundant material. Remove indicator words. So 
um, we've got this passage here. This when the central argument of the <clears throat> passage we looked at before could be represented like this, right? This is standard form, premise, premise, conclusion. Okay, so there's an exercise about that that you have to submit and uh, there will be an answer sheet available if, um, and hopefully that will help you understand what's going on. Um, on the practice test, you will be given random arguments to put in standard form. Um, and uh, I'll link to a couple more videos that will hopefully help explain this idea of putting arguments in standard form a bit, uh, because it's crucial for how we're going to represent everything that uh, we talk about in this course. All right, so that's Mencius and uh, ideas about argument. Next up, I want to talk about uh, Confucius's role as a student and a teacher, and there's going to be some exercises around that.